Hey everyone, it's Brandon Lee, host of the podcast Escaping Rock Bottom. I am so glad to have my buddy back on the show. Um, I had Wes Gear on the podcast in my first season, and now we're rocking and rolling. I'm so glad to have him back. You likely know him, yeah. He he plays music, and he's damn good at it too. He uh, he played with a band called Corn um, back in the day, and now he's the man, the myth, and the legend behind an incredible, incredible program. It's called Rock to Recovery, um, which we're gonna we're we're gonna yeah. dive into. Plus, he's part of a new band. He's gonna share some of that with with us today because music I know is part of his soul and that's what reaches his his inner soul to help him live a beautiful life. Wes, it's good to have you here, man. Thanks. Good to see you. It's good to hear you. I know. Yeah. And, and, and I love, uh, follow him on Instagram too. He, he just always has some super inspirational stuff on Instagram. So find West gear on Insta as well. Um, dude, let's just jump right into it. Um, tell me a little bit about, yeah. there's been so much, you know, because of the pandemic, I always say the opposite of addiction is connection. And the, the, the moment we took away that connection from people, it's one of the reasons why I believe that there is just so much relapse and, and alcoholism and addiction that's happening right now. One of the things I want to talk to you about, mm-hmm. um, especially our youth, is is this program Rock to Recovery, um, and and how you're able to use music as a way to kind of get through to that younger generation who may be kind of going off the rails early on in life. Well, yeah, for sure it helps with the younger generation, but um, you know it's funny we tried to plug it in any well we've been adventurous enough to plug it in anywhere we had the opportunity. Um, and it started where I was working in rehabs and, you know, in Orange County, California, it's a lot of, you know, early twenties, heroin junkies and all that, but you know, music works for everybody. I just got to say that for sure. So it's not just aim at young, younger demographic. Um, but you know, w- when I did it, it was basically like, I went to rehab and then the corn gig was ending. What do I do now? And so it's like, okay, I don't want to get into self pity. And I know I should be sober and which makes you kind of feel, you could kind of feel different. I don't anymore, but you know, and then, and then I'm a musician. So you're like, am I sentenced to be a broke ass musician? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, God, I know I'm not here to, if you're up there, no, but uh, um, you know, I know I'm not here to suffer. So if this is who I'm supposed to be, how do I help people and make a living? And that was what cracked the heavens open, if you will. Um, And so the idea was like, you know, if we're going to do yoga and treatment, if we're going to draw pictures with crayons, then why isn't music there? And that's all I knew. I just started with that. I wanted to get it in there. And now we're in our ninth year. And when you see what it does, like we know scientifically that when we play music, no matter how simple it is, you you know, you could just be playing one note on the guitar if you're a beginner. Uh, By the way, Rock Recovery is a program for non-musicians. Yes. Get them to sing, write, and play and perform a song that we record at the end of one session. So I meet 10 or 12 people. We talk, we connect in that place of misery or pain or whatever we're feeling, joy, hopefulness, but usually in a treatment center, it's of the darker type. And we write and record a song. And so what happens is with the brain and body chemistry, it's It's creating serotonin release and dopamine and then oxytocin, which is the love molecule, which is what you secrete when you feel connection. You're working as a group and you're getting the catharsis of getting the um, music out. And one of the analogies I use is like, you know, if you look at a little a young uh, child at the grocery store, they just dance and wiggle and laugh and they don't care if anybody's looking. They're like ah, in their own little world. <laughs> and then we get heartbreak and mean parents or school hurt and we get this crust over us and we become like we lose that. But see, all we've done is become encased in this crust. But that child like spirit is still there. And that's what we are using drinking or drugs or even people use sex to get out and like just break out of the mind. But when we get in the body and we're playing and singing together, we're getting into that like, hey, there's that playful person inside of me. So the therapist would walk by and, you know, they're like, wait, you got Bob up there who doesn't talk to anybody. Bob's from Oklahoma and he's an angry construction worker who drank too much beer, but he's up there like, you know, living his rap star dreams. And like, how would you do that? We have this elixir and this this catalyst and this impetus of music and performance. And so it's, it's been quite impactful. And we just keep discovering new ways. And the new way that I'm really 
tapping into, you know, as, as you were talking about the set up the show, like we keep growing spiritually in our awareness, but it's being in the body. Yes. You know what I mean? It's being in the body and, and think about it. I was thinking about, I was meditating. And I almost uh, had this idea just to start a program to be in the body. Imagine if you took a bunch of depressed people and you had them like, okay, right now we're going to flex. Like we're powerful Rawr! right now. We're going to scream all our anger out Rawr! <laughs> You know, right now we're going to cheer. Like we're happy Yeah, Like we just get shut off to expression and it has to, you know, and I think music and playing and all that is definitely a big part of that. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And, and and it comes back to this this whole thing that I tell people all the time, whatever, you know, 12 step program that you sub- subscribe to, that there's no one way. There's no one way to get sober. And for me, it is a full on multi prong approach, right? Like going yeah. to meetings, it's just a sliver, right? It's just a sliver yeah. of the pie. And what yeah. I have found, you know, you know, to find myself spiritually, you know, over the past year, you know, and I've got time in the rooms, but over the past year, I was just doing these violent shakes at night, like violently shaking for hours on end. And, and I was working with a trauma therapist, talk therapy, right? So I'm always in the frontal lobe, but what I've added to the mix is shamanism. And I'm actually working, he's a certified trauma therapist, but he's also a shaman. And what I'm doing through deep breath work, it's a, it's almost a three hour session and I'm doing it through deep breath work within 30 minutes of deep breath. I am able to get past the frontal lobe and get back to the lower um, amygdala where the trauma is stored. Mm-hmm. And I'm able to see my childlike parts almost in a video, like in, in wow. a video reel and go back and heal that inner child, that inner trauma. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm a firm believer that if we go back and heal the trauma, we can truly have lifelong sobriety. And I think that sometimes Absolutely. we forget that trauma aspect and you can't get to that trauma aspect by just going to meetings. So I've kind of added that spiritual aspect to me and it's changed my life. Like absolutely, absolutely so, changed my life. Yeah. So one thing is we have to define trauma and I'm going to guess that I could be wrong, that the majority of the world doesn't know what trauma is. Now you can have emotional trauma that is as much as your mom like if you're a young girl and she's like, oh, honey, you have the ugliest toes. And after that, you don't wear open toe shoes. Yep. Though There's tons of little teeny and people like, so what? Don't be a baby. No, no. We create these walls and programs that just get encoded in ourselves and we don't even realize it. And then you talk to this girl who's your friend now and she's 37. I never wear open toe shoes. Why? I don't know why. Oh, because when I was five, my mom and, you know, yes. but there's eight million trillion versions of that story. So when we're talking about trauma, what we're talking about is the little things that hurt and they stung and they make us go, nope, our brain goes, we're not doing that again. And it's the same as putting your hand in the hot stove Yep. and it creates this, these walls in there. So I love your talk, talking about breath work. When we went into uh, COVID, um, you know, rock recovery, we go physically into treatment programs. We had to go online and do a lot of stuff, but I wanted to be more supportive to the community and I've seen breath work in action where you do the, you know, the three cycle breathing exhale. And, and it's exactly what you're saying that um, scientific explanation. And so we offer a free breath work twice a week. I forget which one, one of them, but the other one's Saturday mornings, 10 AM California time, free to the public people tune in all over the world. And my favorite way to describe it is you, I've seen atheist agnostic pissed off bikers find God. Now I'm not religious or pushing any of that, but what Either I'm saying am I. Yeah, is, yeah, like yeah. you're saying, <laughs> it just shuts this up. Yes. And you tap in and you go, oh shit. And I think you know you were you were alluding to this point is that it's so important that in recovery we don't a compare people's programs to ours, but we also don't compare traumas, because yeah. what may be traumatic to you, Wes, may not be traumatic to me. Where I look at that and be like, really, that threw you sideways? That threw you sideways? Yeah. And because yeah. when I share my story and I go around the country and speak, and I you know, and I did have a lot of childhood abuse, whether it be molestation and physical abuse, I never want somebody else out there to be like, well, I was never molested, so I I, I shouldn't be as bad right. as Brand. And, and maybe my trauma and limiting their own trauma. And that's not what it's about at all. And I think that was a great point, you know, that you, that you really did allude to. Uh, 
can I just get your thoughts as somebody kind of, you know, you have a huge platform and, and I always believe those of us with a huge platform, we have a huge responsibility in how we use that platform to, to deliver a message. Right. And so, you know, I got sober in California. You live in my hometown, Laguna. I love that. I love the OC. Um, you know, here's the thing, the whole California sober thing is making, is making headlines everywhere with Demi Lovato's, you know, her path to recovery and, you know, not judging her and I want her to do what's best for her. But the issue that I have right now is that so many, she has like a hundred million followers who follow her and she came up with this term California sober. And it's like, I got sober in California, you know, and and her definition is California sober is just don't use the drug that brought you down, but she's still actively drinking quote in moderation. And she's still smoking marijuana. You know, my whole take on that Wes is that, you know, that's not sober. The definition of sober is, is abstinence. It's not sober. And it really puts a negative label on those who are truly sober in California immediately being like, Oh, you're from California yeah. and you're sober. Oh, okay. We get, we got you. We, we see what you guys do. And I'm, I'm, I'm here's my concern is that there's a huge swath of youth and, and, and middle-aged adults who listen to her music who may say, Oh, maybe I can do some modified drinking in order to control it. If, if drinking was never my issue. Well, I'm right with you on this. It made me mad and I'll explain why in a second, but hearing you reflect back a lot of my feelings, I I suppose you could argue that if somebody isn't sure um, they've got a, you know, a serious problem or how bad the problem is, they're, they're, they're already going to keep trying to use and control it. That's for sure. And that's what what we we do. We always try to stop before we have to really get help. Yeah. Yeah. But sober is sober. And the reason I don't like that is because (laughs) people will die because of that, what she said. And I'm not trying to be dramatic or like be cancel culture or any of these bad things. I'm going to explain here. There's a type of alcoholic, and I I like to explain this a lot, that a lot of people just don't understand that's defined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is important because this type of person can't use anything safely. You and I know this. If we, even though heroin might, and I've sponsored guys like this, heroin was their problem, but they smoke weed because it wasn't their problem. It sets off the allergy. This is the theory AA came up with that has been proven time and time again for this section of people. It produces the phenomenon of craving. So then they go from the weed to the booze. I don't have a problem with beer. Let me snort a little cocaine. That's not, and next thing you know, they're back doing dope or they just get hung up on cocaine with a cross addiction. So the point is, A, it's not sober, and B, a lot of people can't ever use anything safely or they will die, and that is me. So that's what really bums me out. And I think the other thing we got to look at for people like me who've watched people with, and you have too, with 20, 30 years sober, they stop working on their spiritual program, and they go out and get loaded, and they're dead within a few months. They pick up right where they left off. Right. So- Now it's important because nobody wants to go all the way sober. Nobody wants to. So now I'm going, okay, either this is going to work for Demi. And what, by the way, the other thing I'll say is it's not California sober. It's called harm reduction. Yes. And that's what they call it. It's aimed for like younger people. Hey, you're drinking a little too much, getting some problems, maybe too much weed. Okay. If you're going to use, use responsibly, blah, blah, blah. That's what she's doing. It's harm reduction. I'm doing harm reduction. But, um, Yeah, I forgot. Oh, oh, let's. So now, what the last thing I was going to say is now we got to watch Demi because either she'll pull it off and we want her to pull it off because we want the best for her. But if she's a real alcoholic, even though drugs might be her primary choice, she could still be a real alcoholic by definition of the allergy, in which case we will watch her crash and burn in time because that's what alcoholics do. I'm praying for her best well being 100%. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that. We all want to see. I think she's a beautiful person, has a beautiful voice, and has a and, and has fa- and uses music. And and it is an absolute. I mean, addicts are super creative people. Obviously, Wes, you're a musician, and and you know Demi's a, a, a pop star as well, and she's super talented. And addicts are super talented people, right? And they, that the stereotype that addicts are just people who live on the street, they're hopeless, they're helpless, and and they're just trash to be discarded of. It. They're just so much. They're 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 intelligent, bright, charismatic, and creative creative people, unfortunately, a drink or a drug takes all of that away and can, mm-hmm. and, and can, you know, diminish that in moments. Um, tell me a little bit about, about this, this new band you're part of. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, I just want to say, I'm not trying to judge Demi. I'm just no, not at all. from experience. I hope she's got it right. And just rockets into the 
dream life and stays there forever. Um, praying for her best. Uh, anyhow, um, so it's a new band. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a guy who can sing. And so, I, but I'm a songwriter and I produce music. And so, uh, you know, after stopping playing with Corn and my old band head, it was kind of like, well, I'd love to do music. Where does a singer come from? So I'm doing a rock recovery session in one of the grittiest hardcore places I go with like, you know, guys, rough dudes. I don't want to, you know, and then they were, and so this worker there was like, uh, sometimes we let the staff join us. Cause sometimes you're desperate for like somebody, you know, we need assistance here. <laughs> and he's like, uh, he's like, uh, I sing, I'll help with the lyrics. And I'm like, great. You handle that. Meanwhile, I'm trying to teach it. Anyhow, it's a rough crowd. And they, okay, I'm done with the lyrics. I'm like, okay, worker guy, and whatever. <laughs> Let's hear what you got, Mr. Rehab Worker. And he's like, ah! uh, like, what? I mean, he didn't sound like that, but he had this incredible voice. And so a few months went by. I hired him for Rock Recovery. We start doing our benefit show. It's like, let's write a song together, dude. And I sent him the crappiest idea I had just so I could hear what his voice sound like. Not on purpose. Just like, mm, here, just let me hear your voice so I can vibe out. And it came out friggin' dope so we grabbed clinton who plays in uh di legendary punk band and we've been jammed with scott who played drums and train and we're loving it it's called human but of course you gotta spell it weird so it's like h-u-e like hue as in color color men like plural but of course the e's are three so it's h-u-3 m-3-n see that's the creative side of you <laughs> well you know i hope i didn't <laughs> screw myself i mean but but i think it's easy if you can get to the h-u-3 part you can find us because there's not many of those out there. No, there's not. But we're gonna we're gonna spread that. When when's your first song gonna be released, like on Spotify and stuff? Yeah, it's coming up. We we just shot the video for it. We haven't picked the release date, but you can follow uh, Human on Instagram. It's probably our strongest platform. We got some uh, IGTV and U uh, YouTube's great. We got videos out already of these early we're really artsy band like we do trippy weird acid type videos and stuff because <laughs> we used to do a lot of drugs hey you can do trippy acid type shit and be sober it's still fun and <laughs> yeah no I, I i always tell people like even through and i'm not even a, I, I i have never been a good meditator right my brain just goes every which way every time i try to meditate but let me tell you like the deep breath work i tell people i'm like honestly it's like a free high like you literally yeah. feel high yeah. just with oxygen in the with with the yeah. right breathing techniques it's it's mind-blowing stuff um can i ask you this because i ask everybody this and i think it's it, it, it's it's my purpose my my passion is news and storytelling i love to just sit down with somebody human interest stories are my thing and i love to share people's stories that's my passion but my purpose wes is to to spread a message of hope to show people that look where i was and look at the life i have now and you can have this too because i used to be a junkie and i'm no longer a junkie and my life's amazing today i want to ask you this how do we end the stigma i have my beliefs on how we can how we can really end the stigma and, but I always like to ask people who have a lot of experience, strength, and hope, how do you think we end the stigma around mental health to make it a little bit easier for those who are suffering in silence, thinking that they are alone in their own thoughts? How do we reach those people and how do we end the stigma to make it a safe space for people to come forward? Well, I think it's happening. Um, you know, I think what humans don't do very often is do the 60,000 foot view of humanity on a whole. And if you look back to like how much consciousness is evolving you know even in the 50s a, a man a husband could have a mistress and look and people look the other way he could physically harm his wife and nobody said a word now you know if you saw that everybody like boop, 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 you know and we didn't you know rock stars were starting to die of drugs we're like oh drugs are bad wait in the 70s you know hendrix and J joplin and then we watched kurt cobain and chester so i think it's an inev an inevitable tide that's coming of awareness because look at guys like you and I out there sharing right. the story and we're doing it more and more. And I think we just got to keep doing what we're doing, keep sharing the story. Um, I think one thing is they always say, I was having this discussion with somebody yesterday, like, what can we do to change the world on this topic? And it always starts at home. So for anybody listening, tell your friends, just go, Hey man, if you're ever struggling, come and do we got that agreement? I will never judge you. Yes. And start telling your friends your darkest thoughts and start being vulnerable because guess what? I love what my friend says. It sounds super emo, but it's true. We're all just damaged children. 
because we come here free of spirit and we get hurt. And it's part of life. It doesn't mean we're babies. It doesn't mean that we're not men. It doesn't mean any of that. But it means we're all carrying hurt and damage. And the more we share it with each other and make it a safe space to talk about, the more that line's open of communication, then when somebody really hits the shit, you know, bad, yeah. then they'll go, dude. Yeah. But if we're not co- talking about it all the time, then when it really happens, nobody's going to want to talk about it at all. Yeah, I, you, you said it beautifully. Um, and, and I'm of the belief, like, here's my thing. And, and, and this is my message to anybody who's ever watching or listening to the podcast. And they do have experience, strength, and hope in the rooms. And they're still living a life of anonymity. Um, this is what I encourage everybody to do. I encourage everybody with, you know, who's secure in themselves, they've got experience, strength, and hope is to break that anonymity, go onto social media and share your story, you know, be brave enough to share your story and peel that back. Because the moment everybody does that, if everybody did that in the world today, Wes, we would, the public would see that news anchors are addicts, rock star, well, a lot of rock stars have addiction in them, right? But we would see therapists and you would see uh, top doctors, CEOs of major corporations, people who have an incredibly successful life that we aren't yeah. people who are just on the streets. We're not homeless. We're not jobless. Yeah. We're not these. We have created beautiful lives in recovery. And I believe if we, re- we remove the anonymity part of it, suddenly we're like, oh, dude, you, you suffer from mental health too. Yeah. That just makes yeah. it a little bit easier for another person to come forward because we know when we're working with sponsees, we're mentoring people. I always share first. Let me let me share a little bit about my my trauma and my past because that opens up the door for yeah. you to be open and honest with me. The more of us who are out there with a larger platform who speak out about recovery, I'm proud yeah. of the recovered addict I am today. I don't have any shame about my past anymore, yeah. but that's not the case for everybody. So I think yeah. if we all just break that anonymity and we finally come forward, then I just believe because anonymity is is somewhat rooted in shame, societal shame. That's why people stay anonymous because they're fear that their employer will fire them because they feel that they're not going to be a good yeah. worker, or they that they're a failure. So I'm all about people stepping up to the platform, speaking out, standing up, putting a face to recovered addiction to make it safe. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things too. One reason that they wanted to be anonymous is they wanted people to have a safe space to come in because right. people are afraid. Correct. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that I stole my grandma's wedding ring for crack, you know, but I, you know, so they, we have to create a safe space. Um, and the other thing is it would be horrible if every time, because, you know, relapse, people relapse. I, I saw you a high majority, a, show, a high majority. Yeah. I, I mean, most people relapse because it takes a few times to get it and some yeah. never get it. So, you know, you do have the danger of if people are like, Hey, I got a week sober. I do. Narcotics Anonymous. And then people see him strung out, shooting dope, putting them like, well, Narcotics Anonymous don't work. So there's that kind of thing too. We got to be careful, you know, but what I love is what Macklemore says. He says, look, man, I'm sober. AA got me sober. I know there's um, anonymity, but look, if I get loaded again, it's not because AA failed me. Right. It's because I failed AA. hundred yeah. percent because no program is perfect. So I, right. you know, like you can go to AA and it's not perfect. You go there and say, how many people have relapsed and like more than half the room will raise their hand, yeah. especially now I'm at treatment centers. And the message that I'm getting from them is that a lot of people have so much shame when they relapse because they don't want to go back to the rooms and like cash in all their six or eight or 12 year chips to get a, you know, to get a 24 hour one because it's rooted. They feel that shame of that relapse. But I'm like, there's no program that's perfect. Nothing is perfect out there to get somebody sober, nothing. Right. And so, you know, you know, I, I think that's a beautiful way to say it's like, but if we are open about it, we become more accountable as well. Yeah. Right. Because the whole yeah. world friggin' knows I'm, I, I, I'm a recovered addict that if I go down a route, I'm going to have a ton of people being like, yo, what are you doing? That's a great point. Yeah. I think there's one more facet to it, which is, well, a couple, which is cultural and the family, because it is a family disease too. So, you know, where for me, I felt okay. And I've already been in a band. And so we love to talk about ourselves. Look at me. I'll tell you everything. Yeah. You know, it's kind of <laughs> how I was brought up, but when you maybe get into other families where there's very demure and it's quiet and it's like, what would mom think? And what would, I know of a, a famous uh, uh, model whose mom will not believe she has mental health issues or is an alcoholic. And it's like, look at the girl. She's yeah. clearly struggling. And so, so, you know, even though she's out there on these platforms saying everything and, and being risque and all these things, 
she can't put that root down of herself because the family is like a cement slab blocking that. And so, you know, it's, it's multi-tiered for everybody, but I think the more, yeah, we just got to chip away and keep talking about this. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of families it's, it's, it goes back to that saying too, that our families are like, Hey, we keep our dirty laundry in our house. We don't, we don't let the, you know, the dirty laundry out that in itself is rooted in shame because they don't want, you know, a mom or dad doesn't want a society to think that they're bad parents. Right. But if we just say mental health is here, like we all suffer from some sort of mental health, you're not wrong. Like you're not bad. You're not a bad mom just because you have a child that maybe went off the the rails. You know what I'm saying? So you don't have to have a perfect life. Nobody's life is perfect. And it's one thing that like, I see people on Instagram and, and they just portray this perfect life. And I just look at them. I'm like, your life is not that perfect. Like you will actually connect with another human being. We connect, I believe through our scars, right? Through, Mm, through, through the trenches that we've been, not through perfection because perfection Mm. is unrelatable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one other thing that, that again, that 60,000 foot view is the LGBTQ ad letter, ad letter, yeah. ad letter. That is a great testament for how people are just being authentic and real. Not just yep. like, hey, I might be gay or whatever, but like this variance. And that so as those boundaries of expression come out, it makes room for mental health. It makes room for addiction and all that. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, society, go, 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 go. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it feels shameful for a lot of people, but, uh, you know, I don't know, (laughs) don't we all know so many people that are, you know, affected either directly or indirectly by this? Yeah. You you can't hide anymore. No, you can't. And I just, and I love you, man, because you're such an example to me. I mean, Wes is a guy who inspires me. Um, you know, I have people that DM me and they're like, man, you're so inspirational. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? I find inspiration through people like Wes, you know, because I look at their lives and I, if I'm having a tough day and I, you know, I go on because I know you're real, like you are the ultimate real dude. So like when I see your stories and your shares on, on, on social media, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I'm like, remember people like Wes, like Wes goes through tough times, but look where he's at today. And he's having a good day today. I can have a good day today. And, um, so I just want to, you know, take that moment to say, thank you for being real, um, with your platform. Thank I you. think that's, I think that's too, brother. hugely important. Um, so listen, I would love to have you back on again. I'll just, you know, whenever, Anytime. you know, I'll just, I'll just send you a message be like, Hey, we well, want to hop on for 30 minutes and talk recovery. Um, so Anytime, man. So listen, if you're a parent, uh, if you, if you're a parent or you're somebody who's struggling right now, uh, check out rocktorecovery.org. Yeah. Uh, go online, check it out. It is an incredible program that is proven to get to people that others can't. Therapists and I might not be able to get to them, but they go to Rock to Recovery and they can, they might have a chance to break through. So check that out, yeah. and also check Thank out you. Wes's new band called Human. It's H U. Yeah. It's the three. It's a, the number three because it's the E backwards. Yeah. Men. Yeah. M E N. Look, I was going to do this. That's what I was earlier. Yes. When I was being, and I it's amazing real. our word too. See, it's. Is it backwards? Um, it is not backwards for me. It's, it's perfect. Okay. Okay, yep. Cool. It was so perfect. That, that's going to be our single art word. That's Tyler Spangler. And I just want to end with this. First of all, you're rad. <laughs> everything I say is a regurgitation of everything else I've been taught by people you, like you and all the other inspiring people out there. And I want to let people know that I struggle all the time to this day. The difference is the struggles aren't as deep and they don't last as long and I know how to get out of them, but I have suicidal ideation still this day. My brain's like, yep. Screw finding a wife. You should just kill yourself. Hello. So I got to say that I got to name it. I'm 13 years sober. I work with therapists. I do all the shit. And sometimes my brain says, fuck your life. It's screwed. You should just kill yourself. I have a mental health disorder. It's a daily battle. Well, you know what? You just brought up something that I want to, I, I definitely want to do another podcast with you. By the way, I'm, my door's open. My door's open. I'm yelling that. <laughs> <out into> my- <laughs> She's like, oh my God, somebody get over to Wes's house now. Um, because Sorry. I too suffered suicidal ideation and it's something I'm, I'm about to start speaking out a little bit more publicly, but it's something that happened to me in January, you know, and I look at me, people will be like, what? You had suicidal ideation. I'm like, yeah, there, that's what got me into shamanism and the spiritual aspect because that's what forced me to go and finally, you know, reach out and 
do deep spiritual work because I too, I'm like, yeah, my life is amazing, but don't forget, I, you're not alone with your suicidal ideation thoughts. Like that's, mm -hmm. that was me too. Um, mm -hmm. But we can get out of it. We can get out of it. And so mm -hmm. I love you, brother. We'll talk soon, man. You, you're the bro. best. Yeah. Thank All you. right, my dude. You too.